I've entitled the sermon, God is Not a Genie. We've had some famous genies uh, in Hollywood, in TV, and in movies. And uh, I want to share some with you as we, uh, c- uh, as we uh, go along. First of all, the uh, first one is Barani in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And then we have Melissa McCarthy in Genie. And uh, I saw that with Sheila and Darren. That is a good show. Uh, we have the live motion uh, movie called Aladdin. And if you will remember that movie, Will Smith was the blue genie. Uh, and then we have the animated Aladdin. And we remember Robin Williams being in that. And the thing about Robin Williams is they never had to tell him how to act. Uh, he always acted crazy, uh, and uh, they said some of the things that, that he did was a more of an ad lib. But what we know about Genie, Robin Williams' Genie, is you never had a friend like me. And then the probably the most famous Genie of them all is I Dream of Genie. Now that TV show was almost banned off of TV. Because Barbara Eden dared to uh, show her belly button. And so they almost didn't allow that show to be on. But it's probably one of the most famous genies of them all. If you have found 1 John 5, 14 to 15, would you stand for the reading of God's word, please? Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we can come together. And Lord, I pray that you speak through me as I speak to this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. We have five, we've looked at five different genies and uh, famous genies from Hollywood. However, who we cannot include as a genie is God himself. God is not a genie, but somehow, especially in the prosperity gospels, they treat God as though he is a genie. They say things like this, if we ask anything, if we ask anything, or whatever we ask, God has to do that for us. And we're going to look at that. What it says is that God hears us whenever we pray. It is as though with the prosperity gospel, it's three rubs of the magical Bible, and then God all of a sudden does things for us. Well, you know, it really would be good to own a mansion. I've been in several mansions. I've spent the night in mansions. They're beautiful. I would really like to have a mansion, and because it says in God's Word, whatever I ask, then God has to do it. So, folks, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the house is very nice, but I'm getting a mansion tomorrow. But that's not going to be enough for me, because I really want a wonderful sports car. Now, the problem is, when Linda was living... I would go, ooh, isn't that a nice car? And she says, you'll never get it. Because she knows that I like to go from zero to 120 miles an hour in a split second. But because if it says in the Bible, whatever I ask, God has to do it. I I like my blazer. It's nice. It gets me from point A to point B. But I'm getting a sports car tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Or maybe John meant something different. But it's interesting how the prosperity gospel, they say, now, I want this. I want my fifth airplane, and I have to use it. It's for the ministry. Of course it is. It's for the ministry. And here's the catch. Here's the interesting catch. The way that I'm going to get it is if everybody will give me $100, then that will be wonderful. One of the people... It was Oral Roberts back in the 1980s. It's interesting because he said, if I don't receive $2 million, 
in the next month, I will have a heart attack and I will die. What I was praying for may not have been right, but what I thought is I hope nobody gives him $2 million. Not that I wanted to see him die, but it's making a mockery out of God, really. And then at the last second, a couple of days before the month was up, somebody who was a millionaire gave him $2 million. And he said, see, all I have to do is ask, and God gave it to me. God hasn't promised to give me all of my wants. He's promised to give me my needs, but not all of my wants. And we see that in the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9 says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Well, obviously, Paul, who wrote this, didn't believe that whatever he asked, God's going to do it for him. As a matter of fact, he asked, didn't he? He's asked three times that the thorn be removed, but it wasn't. Jesus speaking here, Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. It was painful, but he knew that he had to pay the price. But here, he wanted the cap cup passed from him. But God knew a different plan. God wanted a different plan made. But the question is this. Is the Bible true? Can I base my faith upon the Bible? And obviously, if we look at it, and it says whatever we ask, God will do it, the Bible can't be true if he doesn't do it. So is the Bible filled with contradictions? Or did John maybe have a different meaning than what many read into that scripture? I want to look at these two things. Contradictions, first of all. My Old Testament professor said this, and I think it's very good. A pre preconceived contradiction is based upon preconceived assumptions. In order for me to see preconceived contradictions, I have to have a preconceived assumption about whatever that is. In other words, we like to fill in the blanks. And speculate is okay as long as we don't make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. Now, science says a man cannot be swallowed by a well and the man live. Now, I think it's quite interesting that this is the case. What The thing that they say is the the throat muscles are too small for a man to pass through. Well, first of all, it didn't say that the uh, big fish swallowed. It says that he was in the stomach, and we pre we pre our preconceived assumption is that he swallowed. And the second thing is this. Nothing says that the big fish, the great fish, was a whale. So we've already put in preconceived assumptions about it. Now that came up in a first grade uh, class, educational class, and the teacher was so tired of the student, the young student, saying that uh, Jonah was swallowed by a well. And so she called her on it, and she said, Well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah himself, what happened? And the teacher, thinking that she was going to be smart, said, well, what if he doesn't go to heaven? She, the young child looked at the teacher and said, well, then you ask him. So 
we have preconceived assumptions about certain things that we don't have the facts with. As a matter of fact, what they have found out now, and it is in the Guinness Book of World Records, a well can swallow a person and they live. Ask in my name. John 14, 13 says this, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Some of the things that we ask for isn't to glorify the Son, Jesus, but it is to glorify me. Let's go back to the mansion in the car I was speaking of. Is that to glorify God? Well, I can make it up to be. You know, I can get around a lot better with a really nice sports car. Do I need a really nice sports car? No, probably not. Would I get in trouble with a really nice sports car? Yes, I would. But my blazer gets me from point A to point B just fine. It's doing a great job. Well, I like to live in a mansion. Well, first of all, I probably would have a lot of trouble cleaning the mansion. And one person doesn't need to live in a mansion and just be too big. But is it to glorify Jesus? No, probably not. It's probably more to glorify me. And people look at me and say, well, he's doing well for himself, isn't he? So it isn't to glorify Jesus. It's to glorify my own ego. The catch here with John is that he says this, according to God's will. There is a plan. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says, ask anything in God's will. If God will have it happen. John did not begin with this truth. He didn't start out with this truth. Let's look again in 1 John. We've been going through it since last spring probably. What was he talking about? Well, here's some things. Here's six things that he was talking about. First of all, he talks about sin. Second of all, he talks about the Son of God, Jesus. Third, he talks about salvation. Fourth, he talks about love. Fifth, he talks about false teachers. And sixth, keeping God's commandment. We want to jump to ask whatever we want and then God has to do it without checking ourselves with the six patterns that, that John was going through. We are really good at wanting to jump from point A to point Z in a hurry. When we have those things right, we will be in the will of God. We can ask God anything because we are in the right standing with God. Matter of fact, James 4, 3 says this, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Not for the plan of God, not for the ministry, not for the gospel and, and winning people to Jesus, but because I want to feel good about myself. That's why I want these things. But we can have confidence. I can know that I can have confidence in God and His will. God does not want me to harm myself, or God does not want to harm me, but He wants to see me succeed. If I am focused on God, I know He will hear me. Let's take a little bit of time speaking of He will hear me. You know, there were a lot of things when I was a child that I wanted for Christmas. Matter of fact, I had a huge list saying these are the things I want for Christmas. And I'd give it to mom and dad and say, here are the things I want for Christmas. Did I get everything? No. First of all, if I got everything that I ever asked for, they'd be broke. However, they did get me some things. And typically what they did is they said, what's going to be in the best interest of Doug? However, they did look over the list. They heard me, but they decided what was best for me and what was not best for me. There's three answers that God gives us when we speak of prayer. Number one is yes, and we all love that. Every once in a while, God will say, yes, this is my will. 
The second one we don't like so much, and that is no. No, this is not my will. Garth Brooks, some years ago, spoke about or uh, sang about a song called Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Now, I remember whenever I was young, I thought that the girl that I was going with at the present time was the one for me, and surely God is going to give me this girl. God did not give me that girl. And when I married Linda, I was so thankful that God said no. Sometimes God says no. Here's the hardest one for us all. God says wait. Because we want it, and we want it now. We are not patient people especially when we know that God's going to answer that prayer but he says wait we should ask this question what lesson is God wanting me to learn through this journey that I'm going through we must know who God is and also who I am for I know beyond a shadow of a doubt with full confidence that God will see me through but he doesn't always do it the way that I want him to. When Hudson Taylor was sailing to China to begin his missionary work, his ship was in great danger. The wind had died, and the current was carrying them towards sunken reefs which were close to islands inhabited by cannibals. So close they could see them building fires on the shore. Everything they tried was to no avail. In his journal, Taylor recorded what happened next. The captain said to me, Well, we have done everything that can be done, which is a really good place to be. Um, we've done every, the captain said to me, Well, we have done everything that can be done. A thought occurred to me, and I replied, No, there is one thing we have not done yet what is that he queried four of us on board are christians let us each re, uh, retire to his own cabin and in agreed prayer ask the lord to give us immediately a breeze taylor prayed briefly and then uh certain uh, and then certain that the answer was coming went up on the deck and asked the first officer to let down the sails what would be the good of that he answered roughly i told him we had been asking a wind from god that it was coming immediately within minutes the wind did begin to blow and it carried them safely past the reefs taylor wrote thus god encouraged me ere landing on china's shores to bring every variety of need to him in prayer and to expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and give the help each emergency required knowing that our prayers touch the heart of our loving Father in heaven and that he can meet any need we should be confident that he will hear and answer when we cry out to him God will indeed answer there are many needs here this morning many things that we need we are praying about and I don't know every prayer request that's in your heart but God does the number one biggest need in all of us is to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ without knowing or having the saving grace of Jesus Christ our prayers are invalid it's interesting. First of all, it's interesting when it comes to an atheist. Because I always ask this. An atheist will proclaim that there is no God. And then I will explain to them the God that I believe. And I say, well, who is the God that you believe? They will inevitably get mad because you believe in God. They will do everything they can to refute God. And I ask this simple question. What are, what are you getting mad at? If you don't believe in God, why are you working so hard to disclaim him? 
if I don't believe in any believe in something, I don't try hard to dis dispute it. I just let it go because I don't believe it. Here's a problem: the leading atheist said this: there is no such thing as an atheist. They are just lying agnostics. You see, if we believe that there is a God, we also have to believe that there's something that we need to do. We need a Savior. And that's really the problem. Because if I proclaim that Jesus is Lord, then that means that I no longer have control over my own life. I can't make my own decisions. I have to go to the Bible and say, what does God say? What is God's will? However, those who do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are able to go to the uh, throne. As a matter of fact, Hebrews says we're able to go to the throne boldly because God is our papa, our daddy. But he doesn't always answer the way that we want him to because we ask for selfish reasons. I remember when my wife was passing away. I was driving from Greenville to Vandalia. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm calling your wife home. I screamed, no, you can't have her. That didn't stop God from calling her home. I went through a year of struggle. But what happened to if I ask anything in God's name? Here's what I realized. If she would have continued to live, there are many things that would have set her back. You see, there are many people who deal with something. She had a brain tumor. One of the things that she uh, may have encountered was all, Alzheimer's and uh, uh, dementia. I'm not quite sure I could have handled uh, her living and not knowing who I am. I'm not quite sure I could have stood the things that she could have gone to. There are a lot of people who don't believe in God because they've taken their loved one. And they may say something like this, I prayed for healing, and she wasn't healed or he wasn't healed. If they know Jesus Christ, they were healed. They were healed better than here on this earth because they're called home and they are healed. We don't understand all that God does or all that God calls us to. And that's called faith to know that he really does have his, our best interest in mind. He wants to see us prosperous over the last month and a half. I've had to make a decision to give up my refereeing and my umpire. First of all, I don't like the idea that God asked me to give up anything. I just don't. And it was selfish. And, but I wrestled with that. And I said, okay, God, then what am I going to do? Every time I went to study and take my test, it's like, you won't be doing this next year. I'm like, what? <laughs> I've been doing it for the last five, six years. Why? Is it any different? Well, here's why. You see, if you walk out, if you step out on faith, God will do something better than what you can imagine. After my step study, I have been asked to take leadership in Celebrate Recovery and to teach step studies to people who need to take it. I didn't know that before. It happened last Monday. And I knew that God had been working with me. If I was to take leadership and celebrate recovery, I will not have time for refereeing and umpiring, which I love. So the struggle was this. Am I going to obey God and do what he wants me to do, or am I going to say n no to refereeing and umpiring? It came to the point of this. Am I going to serve God, or am I going to serve God? Doug, and I will be more prosperous by serving God than I am serving Doug. I don't tell you that to lift me up. 
I tell you that because there are so many out there in the pews and on the video that are struggling with a decision of whether to serve God or to serve self. And both of them may be good. And serving God may mean that I have to give up something that I think benefits me. But it comes down to trust. It comes down to faith. God, I will serve you because you have been faithful to me. So I don't, and I don't know your life story. I don't know what you're struggling with. But here's what I do know and have confidence in. God has brought you here today and on video as you watch for a reason. And God knows what you're dealing with. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that we can come together. Lord, and thank you for allowing us to hear, to listen to this sermon. Every one of us, me included. Lord, knowing that you have our best in mind, even when it is scary and we're walking on water and waves are all around us, Lord, I pray that we put our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.